Hello and welcome to Bottom Line as I continue my journey speaking to business leaders across the country, asking them several questions about what's going to get this economy back on the rails and also how they, as either entrepreneurs or businesses, can contribute to the process. My guest for today is uh, Kiran Mazumda Shaw, Chairman of uh, Biocon. Uh, Ma'am, thank you very much for joining us. So, uh, first question, uh, you know, I really come to you at a time, a time when there is a certain amount of gloom across the country. Has this gloom uh, penetrated the distant confines of uh, electronic city in Bangalore or biotechnology companies like Biocon as well? You know, interesting you ask me that question. You know, as far as I'm concerned, our sector, the pharmaceutical sector, actually is not... Uh, in, in, in a state of gloom. In fact, there are great opportunities for the Indian pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical sector. Uh, the reason I say that is because, uh, you know, the global uh, healthcare scenario is very challenged in terms of spiraling healthcare costs and the need for affordable drugs and affordable healthcare. And I think Indian companies actually have a very large opportunity to make a play uh, at such a time. Right. Uh, you know, India is the lowest cost producer of uh, generics. Today, generics, um, you know, account for 30% of the $900 billion pharmaceutical market. Uh, today, um, even in the US, 75% uh, of prescriptions are generics. And it's very interesting that Indian generics actually account for almost 70% of the generics market. But not in India. Why is that? In India too. No, what I meant is the Indian prescription uh, component of generics is much lower than let's say the US prescription. I think so I have just to, so that our viewers can understand. Yeah, I think I need to qualify that a bit because so that people can understand. In India we do, you know, the, the market is generics. So I would say the Indian generics market is really a 90% plus market. Only 10% really uh, are uh, attributable to um, innovator drugs, okay? And uh, the rest is generics. But in India, we have this concept of branded generics and unbranded generics. Whereas when you talk about generics in the U.S., it is unbranded. Right. I think that's the, exactly. yeah. the yeah. difference. Yeah. In India, of course, um, because we have such a diverse uh, range of companies from small cottage industries to very large pharmaceutical companies, uh, we tend to have uh, a differentiation of products uh, where the larger companies want premium on their products and therefore they brand them. Right. Whereas the smaller companies are willing to, you know, address the very commoditized, low margin um, of, you know, opportunities in the market, which is about unbranded generics. Right. So you were saying that things are looking generally good for this sector, but? Well, you know, our sector looks good. There are many sectors that look very promising. But I think in general, uh, the mood is not upbeat. I think uh, there is a lack of investor confidence. And I think internally as well, I'm seeing that there is a concern even by domestic players where, you know, new projects, new capital investments are actually shifting out of the country, such as ours. Right. You know, we are putting up a new uh, facility uh, in, in Malaysia. This is an expansion of our existing facilities. Mm -hmm. We could have done this in India, but we believe that it is a, you know, risk for us. Uh, it, and therefore, we believe that as a growing global biopharmaceutical company, we need to de-risk this by having a, a different uh, location, a different uh, geographic right. uh, location. So, so why is it a risk? I mean, you said that things are looking more or less good because the fundamental nature of the market is still, you know, is still positive, as in for generics, for medicines, for healthcare in India. So the biggest risk I see is that our infrastructure is failing us. We have a huge infrastructural deficit, okay? If you look at India today, we have a huge power deficit, Okay, we have a huge infrastructure deficit in terms of roads and uh, many other aspects of uh, the industrial infrastructure ecosystem. And if we don't fix that, we are becoming a very unattractive investment option. For companies right here, I mean, it's not unattractive for someone else. You're saying that it's really unattractive. No, it's very for you unattractive for others as well because there are other parts of the world 
uh, which are competing with India for investment, such as Malaysia, such as uh, Indonesia. Okay. So if, if the, the infrastructure is a problem, I mean, I, assuming that's, that's a factor that we've known for a while, uh, the people have always been a strong point, right? You've always had access to talent and skills, I mean, which is what the IT companies say, for instance. Why would that be not a strength and counterbalance the other negatives? Well, you know, you're talking about uh, different aspects of the business. You know, if I just want to do research, I would probably do it in India. But if I want to manufacture a product, I would not do it in India. So it depends what part of your business and what kind of business you're talking about. And, you know, even when you talk about skills, I think uh, even there, I think number of sectors are challenged with uh, a skill shortage because we just don't have enough high quality uh, engineers or scientists that are needed by industries to take them to the next level. Yes, we could do a very base level kind of business, but when you want to operate in a value-added way, then I think there is a skill shortage. Right, so here's a bottom line question. Now, you know, India has a, a gap when it comes to healthcare in terms of the number of people who can access healthcare, who can afford healthcare, who can buy medicines, and even when they buy, I mean, literally their life savings get wiped out, right? Why is that not an opportunity for the private sector? Well, you know, private sector has created a very large opportunity. I mean, today 80% of healthcare infrastructure uh, is in the private sector. And if you look at the fact that, uh, you know, India today is a fairly large, uh, you know, pharmaceutical market, even the domestic market is a pretty large market today. Uh, you know, it's a $12 billion market and growing. And it is, uh, you know, expected to be a $50 billion market by 2025. So it is a growing business and it's a great opportunity for Indian companies and for, uh, you know, overseas companies to look at India as a very attractive and growing market. Uh, I think uh, that's not the issue. I think the issue is that the government has not done its bit. Today, for instance, we only uh, spend 1% of our GDP on healthcare, And this is the lowest uh, in the world. Uh, of course, the, the good news is that the next five-year plan has uh, indicated that this will treble, okay? And uh, there are the sort of uh, uh, emerging hope that, uh, you know, things are going to go in the right direction. For instance, uh, there has been no concept of a national health care system. And today the government is talking about taking bold steps in, in correcting that. So, for instance, the first step that they're taking is to have uh, to to freely distribute essential drugs and that's a very important first move uh, and the, the the way they're going to do it is also more Im is quite impressive because what they're planning to do is to get into an e procurement mode right. so that's distribution of medicines so what are the other gaps and and then they've also indicated that they will start a reimbursement model for hospital care through accredited hospitals and nursing homes and and other uh, medical uh, uh, you know centers mm. uh, including diagnostic centers where they will have pre-agreed uh, arrangements with these various accredited uh, institutions so that's really going into the future and you're saying that it's really not going to go downhill from here on because there are things getting fixed yeah and it is going to be a very interesting business and a sector to look at right but at this, I mean, but this also comes at the same time that companies like yourselves are, are going overseas either for research or manufacturing uh, or expansion, right? So how does this uh, then tie into the Indian opportunity? Having said that, I must uh, also say that we are investing a lot in, in um, making sure that India uh, is a strong focus for us. Our own, uh, you know, uh, branded formulations and generics business is very focused on India. So branded formulations is your fastest growing business it amongst is, all your it businesses. It is, it is. And so, and because India is such a fast growing market and because the uh, opportunities are opening up, we are certainly focused uh, and investing in this particular uh, segment of our business. It's, it's a little late in the day for me to ask you this, but how would you define Biocon? Since a lot of analysts struggle with that definition as well, how, how, how does this company get defined. Well, you know, Biocon is a biopharmaceutical company where we have identified very clear growth verticals. Uh, we are not the typical Indian generics pharma company, and that's why I think people uh, struggle to understand what our business is. We have 
clearly identified five growth verticals. Uh, one of them is uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, mm -hmm. uh, which has been our historic uh, bread and butter business based on the statins and immunosuppressants and we're adding to that list of active ingredients. Uh, and we're actually then moving up the value chain into the branded formulations. So formulations now become a very important part of our business, which right now is focused on the domestic market, but very soon we will be looking at other global opportunities, including ANDAs and 505B2 uh, formulations uh, for the US and you know, developed markets. The third vertical that we really are very strongly focused on are biosimilars. And here we are uh, focused very strongly on our insulin's portfolio and biosimilar monoclonal antibodies. And then we have our novel uh, programs where we have a very interesting pipeline of novel products that we are developing for global markets. And finally, we have a very important growth vertical, which is our research services growth vertical, which is also another very rapidly growing business for us. So I'm going to ask you more about the insulin and the cancer cure part, which you've obviously uh, uh, developed in recent years, and also how that is an opportunity in a country like India or a market like India. But we'll do that after a break. Stay with us. You're watching Bottom Line. Welcome back. You're watching Bottom Line. My guest is Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, chairman of Biocon, the biotechnology company. We're speaking to her in our office in uh, Bangalore. Ma'am, you know, before I went into the break, I was trying to understand and asking you to define the kind of businesses you're in. And the larger question, of course, is which of these businesses can drive growth for a country like India? And more specifically, when it comes to maybe areas like insulin and cancer, the ones which I understand, uh, what are the opportunities that lie ahead? Well, like I explained to you, we have these growth verticals and every one of them uh, has a very strong growth potential which we are trying to deliver on. So if you look at uh, you know the, the biosimilars vertical where if you look at insulins per se, uh, insulins is a global uh, opportunity for us and it's a very large global opportunity considering the fact that diabetes is now a global pandemic and especially in a country like ours yeah where we are one of the global epicenters for diabetes. I think here um, we are poised to be a very significant player in diabetes and in insulins. We have a good portfolio of insulins which we are developing and we already enjoy a very good market share with our existing insulin in many, many markets, in many emerging markets. Coming to cancer, now, you know, as you know, cancer is going to be, in the next 10 years, the number one uh, disease of the world. And cancer drugs are certainly going to be very, very key in addressing uh, this challenge. Now, Biocon has focused on chronic diseases where diabetes and cancer mm -hmm. have really been the two focus areas for us. So I just spoke about diabetes and the insulin's portfolio. And when it comes to cancer, the antibodies are going to play a very, very important role going forward. One of the big challenges that immunotherapy or antibody therapy has today globally is the cost of treatment. Biologics are extremely expensive. So biologics and biosimilars are similar, right? No, biosimilars are in very layperson's term generic versions of biologics okay and uh, so if you look at uh, biologics today uh, these are very expensive treatments I mean this is a business that is uh, predicted to be a 200 billion dollar business by 2015 and it is estimated that only 2.5 billion dollars of this will be biosimilars because that's the regulatory uh, gates will only open uh, or the patent gates will only open in 2015. So it's going to be very early, nascent days of biosimilars by that time. But having said that, 50% of that business is going to come from emerging markets. So it's very clear, biosimilars are going to be the next big bolus of growth mm -hmm. for the pharmaceutical industry. And that's why you see a number of companies uh, pursuing biosimilars mm -hmm. as their next growth strategy. 
and Biocon is one of the front runners. You know, you, you talked about an India opportunity. Let's, let's use insulin as an example. Why would, uh, if there is an opportunity, the market is growing, and surely you talked about a $50 billion overall pharmaceutical uh, uh, opportunity by 2025. Uh, why would there be uh, any frustration or a sense of disappointment? No, I'm not frustrated. I'm not complaining. I think insulins is a big opportunity. No, India in general, is, I'm saying this is not... No, I think India is a big opportunity. I think from our, for, for our sector, uh, nobody is complaining about the growth opportunity, neither in India nor globally. I think the bigger challenge for us in our country is really the regulatory challenge. We don't have the optimal regulatory structure to move things fast enough. You know, uh, we've been talking about implementing the Mashelkar Committee report uh, for over six years. Uh, we still haven't implemented it. And we still keep on talking about having a drug authority which is autonomous. We are, you know, constantly talking about revamping the whole regulatory system. It's all there in the, in the Mashelkar Committee report. And we are very slow... Uh, to take important decisions. That's why we have such a huge deficit in power, in infrastructure, in regulatory reforms. I think we can't wait. If we, are a, if we want to be the kind of uh, you know, growing economy and uh, the kind of brick economy that we keep talking about, we have got to take decisions. We have got to implement. We've got to make things happen. That's not happening, and that's what our concern is. Right, and and health. Coming back to the larger issue of healthcare, and and there's a huge deficit. There's no doubt about that. Most of the population cannot afford, even if it can access. The government itself has uh, failed to a large extent in either delivering good quality primary health centres or de delivering primary health centres to start with. So where does this? While it is an opportunity, it also means that somewhere the system is crumbling, isn't it? And and what's the impact of that going to be? See, healthcare is one sector where it's very clear because of this very skewed statistics that I just gave you, where 80% of the healthcare infrastructure is in the private sector and where 80% of healthcare spends is out of pocket today, it has to be a PPP model where public sector government has to partner with private sector to deliver affordable healthcare. And this is beginning to happen. You know, accredited hospitals, getting into bulk procurement, getting into tendering, all this is going to drive down cost of healthcare. And it is going to build a national healthcare system and provide universal health. So public perception, and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll counter this, but public perception is that Indian pharmaceutical industry has not managed to bring down prices as it should, and therefore the government has had to step in through drug price control orders and so on. That's absolutely not true. I mean, I will counter that argument by saying that if you actually look at what drugs constitute as a percentage of the total healthcare spend, it's only 15%. So even if you keep on hammering away at drugs, you're not going to change the healthcare costs by only focusing on drugs. Drugs is, are a soft target. Okay? What about the rest of the healthcare system? Uh, there is no control on hospitals or what they charge. There's no control on doctors and what they charge as fees. Do you know that the logistics uh, component of healthcare is a whopping 20%? Now, if you can actually work on logistics, you can see how much savings you can get. Why are logistics so expensive? Because our infrastructure is so appalling. So what, what, what does this mean for Biocon again? I mean, I, I know you've, you've taken me through what you're doing internationally and domestically and the market opportunity. If you were, you know, it's really coming back to is this what you see in terms of hope or if you see optimism on the horizon? You know, Biocon actually has multiple... Or for you more, I mean, it's... Yeah. yeah. So Biocon has multiple opportunities. I am very optimistic about Biocon's own future because I see a lot of growth opportunities ahead of us. India is a big growth opportunity and you know globally I see huge opportunities. Emerging markets are big opportunities for us. In fact, 50% of our present day revenues come from emerging markets. And then we have the big opportunities in the developed markets, the US, Europe and right. so on. Right. So I think as a company, our global opportunities are very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, as a country, 
I think we have huge opportunities, but we need to be unshackled. Today, because of lack of very strong leadership and more importantly, because of a almost slowdown and of, of decision making, uh, we are seeing a slowdown of economic uh, growth. I mean, you know, today's um, uh, levels of GDP growth are just not sustainable for an economy like ours. We talk of e inclusive economic development right now, but at 5.5 GDP growth, we can't hope to do that. In fact, you're going to have a huge, um, you know, economic challenge ahead of you because you will not be able to lift the poor along uh, in terms of economic development and you're going to have a huge backlash from, you know, the Maoists and other underprivileged parts of society. So what's your, I mean, in, we've, again, in the last two decades, for instance, since liberalization, we've seen several down phases, I mean, for various reasons, maybe not the same as this one. Uh, if you were to apply your gut uh, more than anything else, when do you see things turning and what might change? You know, we've been talking about um, things turning around for the last six months. I think everyone in government uh, sees the writing on the wall. Okay, I think no one can deny that there is an economic slowdown. We cannot keep being in denial and seeking comfort that the rest of the world has also slowed down. You know, I think India has an opportunity to be that bright spot in that very gloomy global economic, you know, environment. environment. But we are not doing anything about it. We are fading away. You know, we don't want to be that bright spot. That's my worry. Because if we don't, then, you know, there are many other people who are going to start uh, shining as bright spots on that firmament. And India will not be there, which is my worry. Because I don't think India as a country really has, has a real problem. Because I think the economic growth opportunities are there. But we are not doing enough to unleash them, to convert them into econ real economic growth, real jobs. I mean, you know, for, for, for instance, I personally believe that the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme is also uh, not creating real jobs. Yeah. If you want to create real economic and sustainable growth, you need to create real jobs. And that real job creation will only come from very serious investment in uh, infrastructure and in, you know, various policy reforms. We are not seeing that. Right, ma'am. We've run out of time. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for on this edition of Bottom Line. We'll be back next week, same time. Thanks for watching.